correct. Um, we'll get rolling. You know, I, from my end, we'll, we'll certainly get started with Texas. You know, uh, a ton of respect for the team and the talent and the the people we're about to play. Um, man, really jump off the film as, as really one of the most dynamic, explosive teams that we've played in, in quite a long time, to be honest with you. So great challenge for our football team. I, I know we're really excited to get back to work. It wasn't perfect on Saturday. Some areas we need to continue to work and grow on. And, um, you know, what a time of year to be able to go do those things. So, you know, with any questions you got for me, I'll answer them. What's Bijan um, Robinson do that's, that sets him apart Ooh. from some others? Yeah, I'd say a lot of others, you know, Randy, to be honest with you. I, I think just as explosive of a football player in terms of maybe what we've competed against at the running back position since I've been here. And I think his ability as a pass catcher, his ability, um, you know, to run in terms of the dynamic running style that he has. And I just think his ability to, to explode out of a cut is maybe as good as I've seen it. And so um, dynamic football player plays really, really hard, um, very consistent. I think one thing we've always said about true tailbacks is they have to do all three things at an elite level. They got to be able to run it, they got to be able to catch it, and they got to be able to block. And he does all of them exceptionally. All right, let me turn this around then. What would if your coach if you're playing against Brees Hall? What would your, be your comments about Brees? Yeah, I think very similar in terms of you know an elite athleticism. You know um, the ability to make one cut and get vertical and explosive down the field. Um, and, and very similar with the ability to catch ball out of the backfield and be very dynamic out of the backfield as well. So, you know, I think both guys have some very similar styles and yet probably a little bit different in some ways as well. You mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Kamani's got a broken hand. Just yeah. what are your thoughts on him, how he's been able to play through that? Boy, I, I'd love to. I'd love to give you the the real deal on our football team in some way. You know, I, I think for, I, I you love it. That. I know you yeah. love it. Um, you know, but uh, I, I I just I would say globally, there's a lot of guys that are playing through a lot. Um, this is one of the toughest group of kids that I've ever been around, in terms of watching our guys gut through it and strain through it and really become. I think making themselves even better through really tough and trying times. And Kamani is a great example. I mean, you know, it, at safety in this conference, playing against some of the people that we're playing against, I think it is a real challenge to not have both of your hands at times to be able to wrap, to tackle, to do some of the things that I think Kamani was doing an exceptional job early on. But what it does force you to do is fundamentally demand you to be elite. And I think what he's been able to, you know, really transfer over as he's worked his way back on the football field is his fundamentals have drastically improved even from the early part of the season, which has allowed him to play good football for us. He's still really physical. I think he even saw that on Saturday, man. He's going to come up and he's got the ability to make open field tackles as good as any of our players in the back end. So, um, you know, just really proud of what he has done. I think he has made a monumental growth from where Kamani was at uh, last January to where he is right now, just as a football player, mentality, a leader. Um, I think he's got a really bright future for us. This is a really esoteric one about injuries, but you've had a number of guys who warm up before games that didn't play. Have you yeah. guys always done that? And is it are they true game time decisions or is it a, 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 just another workout for them? Or Yeah, no, I, I really think for us, you know, if you're not going to play, you're not going to play. You know, I, I, to me, those are things where, you know, if we know that that's a situation that there's no way that guy's going to play, we're not going to warm him up. We'll take him if we're at home, we'll take him in the indoor, we'll work him out prior to, but I don't think there's no, there's any need to trick anybody. You know, I, I think, you know, even this past week, you know, two guys warmed up and just weren't able to go. And, and I do think that has been the mentality of our kids. If they can go, you know, they're trying to go. And, and I do appreciate that as the head football coach, it's a sport where, man, especially this time of year, it's, it's really hard to find guys and teams that are at 100%. And, you know, we've got a lot of guys that are fighting through a lot, and just like everybody else in college football, and I appreciate our kids doing those things. Yeah, I, I don't think it's even as much as them. You know, I, I think our medical staff, I think the relationship we have between our strength and conditioning staff, our medical staff, and our coaching staff, we know we're not doctors. We know that it's those aren't our calls. And, you know, the first and foremost, we have to do what's best for the student athlete in terms of their health, safety, and well-being. And, you know, those calls are usually made by our medical staff. Speaking of injuries, do you have an update on Mike or Jared at all? 
Uh, yeah, you know, I, I really do think, um, you know, let me take Mike first of all. I, I really think Mike was in a, a, a lot better spot on Sunday and Monday than, you know, obviously where he was last week. Um, I thought Mike was really close to playing in the game on Saturday, you know, really worked hard to get himself back. Um, you know, anything obviously can happen between now and Saturday, but I certainly think, you know, he's trending towards being ready to go for this coming Saturday. And then Jared Russ, you know, I, I do, you know, Jared was a, a really a deep cut that he got on the first play of the game. It was really nasty, um, you know, a deal that didn't allow him to come back into the game, but it's not anything that I think is going to keep him out for an extended period of time. So we certainly hope to see Jared back in the lineup this weekend. And then switching gears, I know you mentioned the elite skill that Texas presents. I'm curious, you know, it seems like Daggett was really getting the ball out pretty quick. You know, what's been your message to, you know, your defense to make sure, you know, that passing attack for Texas doesn't get going? Yeah, you know, I mean, just uh, there's so many dynamics against this Texas team. You know, you, you can just say, man, like you worry about the you worry about the passing game and you got in as a lead of tailback as you're going to find that's sitting in that backfield. So I think the consistency of our ability to be multiple, do what we've done really well through the entirety of the football season. Uh, there's some things we could have done better defensively, um, especially in the early part of the game last week. And, you know, it goes back to fundamentals, details, but I don't think it has much to do with scheme. It has to do with how we do what we do, and I think we just got to do those things better. Speaking a little bit of the passing attack, Xavier Worthy, what jumps off the tape and film about him? Yeah, um, you know, elite size, elite playmaking. I mean, some of the plays that he has made, even when covered, ball in his hand, people t aiming to tackle him, you know, those are elite traits. And I, I think those are what, you know, you call sometimes as a coach, man, those are erasers. You, you can have you can have two or three guys there to make the play, and, and they've got the ability to erase no matter what's going on. So, you know, there are some of those on this Texas team in, in a lot of areas. And I think, again, for us, it goes back to precision and detail. We're going to have to be as detail-oriented as we've been um, to be able to have success and be able to play the type of football game that we need to play to be able to win the game. Matt, how do you make sure disappointment doesn't kind of creep into the locker room at this point with a group that came back high, high expectations for themselves, and you know they're sitting here with a five and three record? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think the reality of it is, is you know what we've said we're always about is, you know, we're obviously expectation aware, but we're purpose and process driven, and so, you know, the results have never driven who we are or what we do, um, and you know, I think. The character of, of your football team is always tested this time of year. And the, the reality is everything we still want um, is right out in front of us. And I, I've always believed you get as your work deserves. And we're going to find out what our work has deserved us to be or where it's allowed us to be when the season comes to an end. So, you know, I, I think that's the reality of what we've always spoke, whether we've won or we've lost. Um, you know, we really don't worry about the end result till the end of the season to kind of see where we are and what took us there. But, uh, you know, I think uh, your week in, week out leadership's got to come from your seniors and it's got to come from the guys that, you know, are, are man, we've got a couple, 25, 26 guys, got one guaranteed month of football left here at Iowa State. So, you know, you hope their leadership is the, your, their best when we need it the most. Matt, obviously, since Mike's been here, you haven't been without him, a series here and there, but not yeah. games. How big of a difference did it make that he wasn't out on the field on Saturday? Yeah, you know, I, I think early on, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd love to sit here and say, man, there's no difference without Mike Rose. I, I think we'd be naive to say that, too. I, I would also be naive to say Eric Horn didn't play really well because I think Eric Horn played really well, played over 70 snaps and really played good football for us. I think the, the thing that when you lose a guy like Mike out there, you're also losing communication. You're also losing leadership. And what it forces is it forces other guys to pick up the, to pick up the luggage a little bit. It forces Jake Hummel to go play the best game of his career, and he did. Um, it, it forces, you know, Greg Eisworth to be elite in elite moments. You know, it, it forces any Razarike to play his best game. And so I think any time those things are going to happen, because they're going to happen. And, you know, nobody feels sorry for us. Nobody feels we don't feel sorry for ourselves. Man, it's got to be the next guy up. But I do think when you lead, lose a leader of that magnitude, 
the other leaders have to pick up a little bit of the rope that that's left. And so, you know, I think some guys did and did a really great job of it. Um, I think Eric Horn stepped in and did some great things. But, you know, to be naive and say, man, Mike Rose, Mike Rose has been a staple in our football program for a long time. And, you know, having we are a better team with Mike Rose than we are without him for sure. Excuse me. Um, what lessons, you know, talk about reaching your full potential all the time. What lessons will you, your team have, have to learn from Saturday's loss to, to do that this season? Yeah, you know, I, I don't even know. There's not many monumental lessons that were learned in that game other than the ones that have continued to be reaffirmed. And I, I said this to our team after the Baylor game, and I, I think we understand that. The maturity of our team understands that, but you're still dealing with 18 to 22-year-olds. Number one is everybody's trying to kill you. Like, they are. Right, um, you, you you listen to coaches press conference after the game. They're trying to kill you. They have since last January, and so when they're all trying to kill you, your precision and detail has to be elite. Even though you're tired, even though man, it's the third game in a row of some back-to-back -back emotional football games. Nobody cares, and if you want to be the team you want to be in, you want to reach your full potential, then you got to keep staying the course and you got to keep getting better. And you know, I, I think. That's the beauty of what Saturday was, is some guys did. Some guys were incredible. And some other areas, we weren't as sharp as we needed to be, at least early. And, you know, I think those are great learning lessons for all of us. And, you know, there's a lot of football left to be played, and there's a lot of time for us to reach our full potential. Um, and we have even at times this year, can we do it consistently and sustain it? Um, as I told you, there's not many of those erasers at Iowa State, so our team has to be that eraser. Um, and at times we were Saturday, but we weren't long enough, and, and that was the frustrating part. Going back to that day last August or the end of July, whenever it was, when Texas and OU said they're defecting, did did that? Did you talk to your players about that? Did they? Did you hear them chattering about it, talking about it? You know, what was your reaction to that? Um, yeah, and, and, and Randy, I, I would even tell you, I still don't even know what my reaction is because I don't even know if I thought about it. You know, I, I think it just it happened at such a unique time of the year where you're so worried about your own team and your own self and. You know, I, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. There's never once have I heard our team or players, at least, you know, during our conversations, talk about that. So, you know, I, I think whether that's this off season or whatever, where that becomes a reality of what that looks like or feels like, maybe. But I, I'll be honest with you to say you've even thought about that once would be would be a lie to you. I say Charlie Kohler is playing his best ball of his career. What? How do you respond to that? Yeah, I, I think very. Uh, I, I would say this. You know, Randy, he has. He has played exceptional, um, you know, and, and to be able to come through the tough road of it, you know, I, I really thought Charlie was in the best shape of his life, and I, I really felt in fall camp the first two weeks he was maybe as great as I've seen Charlie. And then to get dinged up right before the start of the season, you know, it was a tough injury. You know, it was an ankle, high ankle sprain, you know, not easy to come back from. And to say that he's playing his best football, dealing with that at such a critical time, in my, my opinion, um, because you're talking about, I think it had lasting effects all the way through that bye week, you know. And, um, you know, for a guy like Charlie to be able to grit through it, tough through it, and play as physical as he's played at times, too, I think those are the things I'm really proud of. But yes, I, I would agree. I think he's playing the best, most complete football of his career right now. Matt, outside of Texas having those athletes to run this offense, what have you seen specifically from Steve Sarkeesian's scheme that makes it so dynamic, so explosive? Yeah, I, I just think if you if you studied Steve in his past, I mean, I think one thing he's got just this a great ability to do is is get the ball to his playmakers. You know, I think great coaches have the ability to put their playmakers in a great position to have success. And I think you look at what he did at Alabama. I think you look at certainly what he did in the National Football League and, you know, what he's done as a head football coach prior to. I think those are things that certainly have been his strength is to be able to get his playmakers, his A players, the football in a position for them to make major impact in the football game. Uh, you touched on uh, Brees and Bijan, but uh, can't imagine there are going to be a ton of college football games this season that feature two really dynamic, explosive running backs. Just how exciting, I know there are 12, 10 other guys on the field at, at any given time, but how exciting do you think that is when, you know, no matter who's got the ball, there's going to be a guy out there that's got the ability to do something really special each time? Yeah, you know, I, I think, again, it says a lot of, more so about both of those young men. You know, I, I think they're both um, 
boy, I mean, both elite talents, and I think even on top of that, just even knowing very little about the young man from Texas, but watching how he does what he does, the sincere appreciation for his character and how he goes about what he does. And, you know, equally, you've heard me talk those same things about Bree. So I think you're seeing two dynamic playmakers and, and, and two guys that have elite talent that are going to keep playing football for a long time. Matt, Gary Patterson uh, was let go earlier this week at TCU. You're now the second longest tenured coach in Big 12. What can you say about the volatility of your your job, so to speak, and the job of a head coach? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I, I, we, we live in a crazy time, and I get it. Um, you know, I think it's – it's. boy, I could, get, I could go down a long rabbit hole on this whole thing. You know, let, let me – Gary Patterson, you know, what I would say, I mean – there's a lot of great coaches in our profession that have sustained success over the long haul, right? And I think anybody in this profession that can do this job for the length of time, especially at one place, um, boy, the character of those people and really what those people have the ability to sacrifice to do, because it's hard. Um, you know, it's a sport that is not, I, I've said it's an imperfect sport, you know, week in and week out and you're dealing with 18 to 22 year olds, but I think Coach Patterson did such a transformational job at TCU. And um, I've had a lot of respect for him just because of the way he coaches. And yeah, I think our, our profession's at a very interesting crossroads right now, you know, and, and I, obviously with the jobs and I get that, but I think also with, man, what are we really doing with 18 to 22 year old young people? You know, have we lost our way? I don't know, but but I think it's a challenging time, and I think it's a very interesting time. So, you know, but my respect for Coach Patterson, nothing short of, of first class. Will there be Gary Patterson and Bill Snyder going forward without, say, 20 years at a non-blue blood and build it like that? Boy, I don't know. You know, that's a great question. I, 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 We'll see. You know, I think it's such a fascinating time right now and, you know, what our profession's going and what it's looking like and what even college football look like in three years. You know, it'll be fascinating to see. But, uh, you know, there's certainly some guys that have done it the right way for a long time and you got a real appreciation for those people. Is it hard to think for college is it, is it possible for college football right now to be too money driven or so money driven that it costs at least two, co two coaches in the big world at least? Right now, or have we been there for a while? <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know. You know, Randy, you know better than I do. So, I, I, I that those are those are awesome questions. Crazy time right now. Crazy time. All right, guys. What's that? <laughs> no, I'll be on the beach somewhere. That's my goal. See you guys.